Epidemics have been part of the human condition and of history. And they have sometimes been very devastating. Historically speaking, uh, remember the plague which completely reshaped the economy of Europe. And when a local outbreak becomes global and spreads all over the world, we call it a pandemic. So what I'll do is to uh, discuss four uh, epidemics that are quite different. And the first one is still active at the moment and um, has been in the headlines of the last year. And that is an epidemic caused by a virus named Zika. Now Zika was a virus that was accidentally discovered in uh, Uganda. Zika is the name of a, um, a forest. And um, it was discovered during research on uh, yellow fever in 1947. And for years it was actually a virus looking for a disease. Uh, it was isolated now and then, and you can see over time here, uh, in Nigeria case and then in Kenya, and uh, some cases in Pakistan. But everything changed in uh, 2014 when there were some serious outbreaks in the South Pacific. Clinically, um, an infection with uh, Zika, uh, for an adult particularly, is not that bad. It's a bad flu with some rash, and that's most of the cases uh, are not more severe than that. But then, about more than a year ago, uh, we saw the spread of uh, Zika as wildfire in Brazil, and then across um, Latin America, at least the, uh, the warmer parts of uh, Latin America, South America, the Caribbean, um, and then um, with some cases, about 210 uh, indigenous cases in Florida and Miami, and also in Texas at the border with Mexico. Zika is transmitted by a mosquito called um, Aedes aegypti. Now that's a mosquito that also can transmit other viruses. Yellow fever, we have a very effective vaccine, but has caused uh, some epidemic in Angola and in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo about a year ago, chikungunya and dengue. So this is a virus and an epidemic that is very much linked to uh, climatic conditions, um, also to poverty, because in uh, Latin America, it's often people living in slums that um, you know, were affected because there's stagnant water that are breeding grounds for mosquitoes. This is not an abstract painting, but it is the evolution of the um, temperature, the average temperature on Earth, um, and last year was the hottest year uh, ever in history recorded. And um, you can't see more or less the, uh, um, you know, the, the continents, but um, yellow is the hottest uh, increase in temperature and red also abnormally warm temperature. And that means that epidemics like Zika, but also dengue, uh, maybe yellow fever, even chikungunya, will increase and will continue to come back because the mosquito will now invade territories where before it was too cold. Now Ebola is a completely different virus which was first isolated and found in northern Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo. I was part of the team that um, isolated the virus and also uh, that investigated the, the epidemic, the first epidemic, which was happening around a mission hospital in the rainforest where uh, about 300 people died with a case fatality rate of 90%. In other words, 90% of people who became infected died. And also that included 11 out of 17 hospital workers. And that's gonna be very typical for future epidemics. It is affecting in the first place the caregivers, either in the family or um, you know, in the hospital, in the, the healthcare workers. Uh, and that's a pattern that we've seen. Now, what we found also is that you need really very close contact with uh, contaminated body fluids. So someone who's sick, they're vomiting, um, bleeding, heavy diarrhea, and or someone who is, has just died and the, the uh, corpse is full of uh, virus. Since 1976, there have been like 25 uh, outbreaks of Ebola all in Central Africa, Congo, the two Congos, and a bit in, uh, you know, in Uganda, South Sudan, and so on. But never really uh, getting um, beyond that. And the reason is that you needed such close contact and also that communication in these areas is limited. But here also everything changed 
Um, at the end of uh, 2013, when in Guinea, in a place called Kekedu, which is at the border with Liberia and Sierra Leone, where these three countries come together, that a child died of Ebola. It was in December 2013. And it took them three months to find out that this was Ebola. First, because nobody was looking for Ebola in an area of West Africa, because the dogma was this is a Central African problem. But also, there's no laboratory infrastructure, no public health system, and countries coming out of uh, civil war, in the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone, professionals have left the country. Um, the health systems are really at collapse, and the countries were really being reconstructed in a very positive way. Guinea coming out of uh, decades of corrupt dictatorship. So we had a, um, you know, a perfect storm that made that um, the virus spread like wildfire. It spread through three countries. And what was new uh, in contrast to previous epidemics is this was no longer um, a, an affair of um, rural areas, small towns, but capital cities were involved and slum areas and so on. And the major reason that this became such a big epidemic is was the lack of action. Lack of action in the first place because of ignorance, we didn't know. And then in the beginning it was only some local communities and uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, you know, Doctors Without Borders, they were active. The local governments had no experience, didn't know what to do. And the international community led by uh, WHO was inactive and took about five additional months between the initial diagnosis and the declaration that this was a problem in August, that was precious time that we lost. We have all these new epidemics have something in common, that is that they're so-called zoonosis, that the, the virus can live outside the human body in animals um, and is happy. In West Africa, we had an epidemic that caused 11,000 deaths, out of uh, 27,000 people who died, including 500 healthcare workers. Now you have to imagine that in Liberia, for example, in 2011, there were 51 registered physicians for a population of about 5 million people. In Sierra Leone, about double, but for the population is a bit bigger. So with all these deaths of nurses and doctors, that made the situation uh, much, much worse than before, um, in terms of human resources, the country shut down. Schools, commerce came to a halt, um, agriculture and so on, and the healthcare system also. Um, and it is not impossible that more people died actually from treatable conditions. Women dying while giving birth, children dying from malaria, uh, children because they were not in, uh, you know, vaccinated against measles, because the country came to a standstill and the health system collapsed. Ebola illustrates how a, something that used to be a local outbreak when the right conditions are there can explode. Now, putting that in a bigger context in the future, what are the pressures that are promoting Ebola outbreaks? And that is population pressure, deforestation, people getting more in contact with um, the potential virus reservoir, and then of course also uh, international travel. We had cases in Spain, in the UK, uh, there was someone in Norway, and also, of course, in the US. Next, um, we go to the biggest epidemic of uh, modern times, and that is uh, HIV. Um, the first report on HIV was published in 1981, in June 1981, five gay men in California. And in the meantime, cumulatively, about 70 million people, seven zero million people who have been infected, all connected in some way or another because they had sex with each other, they shared needles, had a blood transfusion, or their mother, um, you know, had uh, HIV. The data we're showing here start in 1990, so about nine years after the discovery of, or the first report of, uh, of AIDS. And you see that in these nine years, already the virus had spread all over the world. Every single country in the world has reported cases except North Korea. The virus um, has really been spreading the worst way in Africa. It's not that the whole of Africa is very badly affected. Some countries in West Africa have a lower uh, HIV prevalence than some cities in Europe. 
Um, but when you look at uh, southern Africa, which has really become the epicenter of the epidemic, you can see that the, um, the virus was spreading and spreading. And then, thanks to quite some aggressive uh, programs, um, the number of cases, of new cases, this is what it gives here, is coming down. Similar uh, situation in, um, uh, in, in East Africa. However, let's not forget that this is not over. There are still two million new infections every year of HIV. And uh, when you're a uh, young woman in uh, South Africa, in KwaZulu-Natal, your probability of becoming HIV positive today is between 4 to 9% every single year. In other words, by 40, it's about 40% of women, particularly women, are infected. In men, it's a bit lower. And when you take uh, Asia, for example, um, the virus spread non unexpectedly first in Thailand with its sex industry, but then quite effective programs and brought it down to much lower levels. Um, and in India, also major spread in the beginning, but then a gradual decrease. The biggest headache at the moment, I would say, uh, in terms of the spread of HIV, is perhaps very unexpected for most of you, and that is in the former Soviet Union. Ukraine has been known to have uh, quite a serious epidemic driven by injecting drug use, but it is in Russia where um, the number of new cases is c continues to increase at about a good 100,000 a year, and that in a country with a declining population. And that's a result of the absence of effective policies, of bad policies, not dealing with uh, injecting drug use problem, we have effective uh, interventions, but they're not being used. This is a, a, a virus that, again, is a zoonosis. The ancestor of the human immunodeficiency virus comes from chimpanzees, the chimpanzee virus. Um, it illustrates that we can, uh, in modern times, have a sexually transmitted uh, infection that is spreading all over the world, and that will continue. Don't believe anybody who tells you that the end is in sight. It's not true. As long as we don't have a vaccine, I don't believe that we can stop and end this epidemic. We've done a good job in some places and a bad job in others. And we've really brought down new infections and mortality particularly has uh, gone down in a big way. But a big way still is so that 1.1 million people died from AIDS last year. So that's another detail and it's still the major cause of death in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, we've been very successful historically in bringing down infections, thanks to antibiotics, hygiene, vaccines, and vaccines are the best buy in public health. There's a growing lack of confidence, if not more, resistance against uh, vaccines. Overall, the news is good. Less than 1% of people in the world would uh, disagree with that. But there are a number of countries, particularly in Europe, like if you take Italy and France, and then also again Russia and in, in China, um, that are really not uh, thinking that vaccines are that good for children. And that's, to a certain extent, correlated with the um, belief that vaccines may not be safe. Again, Europe, in France, more than 40% of people think that vaccines are not safe. And uh, we can see some in other countries uh, as well. This is ironic. Um, we have something that works very well, that is actually safe, has saved millions of lives, and we know when vaccine coverage goes down that we have epidemics. Let's make sure that one of the best tools we have in public health, we don't, don't throw it away for reasons that are hard to understand. And let me now end with uh, an epidemic that is not caused by a microbe, completely different, but that's really a major, major concern for the future. And that's obesity and associated problems. And in one generation, the number of obese people has more than doubled in the world. It is really spreading like an epidemic, sometimes like an infectious diseases. And uh, when you look at the world, it is the uh, South Pacific that has the highest prevalence of obesity, with over 50% of adults being heavily obese, followed by um, the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, where it's about 40%. And then we have, of course, also in high-income countries where obesity continues to uh, you know, to grow about every year. However, it's no longer just a problem of high-income countries or of rich people, as it used to be. In high-income countries, it's often uh, people who are 
uh, you know, of the poor socioeconomic strata. But we see when we take a country like South Africa today, the proportion of women who are obese is the same as we find in the United States. And that in spite of a major HIV epidemic that's going on at the same time. And then when we take India, we have still 200 million people who are underweight. And there's a lot of stunting and so on. But we also have already about 30 million people who are overweight. That's also a challenge uh, in terms of policy. What do you do with that? And this is a result of, as we all know, urbanization, change in lifestyle, lack of exercise, and so on. And, um, and it's going to be far more complex to deal with this type of epidemic, obesity, than with infectious diseases, because it's not going to be a simple solution. This is where behavior economics, this is where all kinds of interventions should come all together. It is totally unpredictable what will come and that uh, which epidemic will be next, and also um, there will be new epidemics that we then never heard of. Think of HIV, which came out of the blue. And in California, they talk about the big one. The big one is an earthquake which will come tomorrow or 100 years from now or not. Silicon Valley will be wiped out one day. And uh, in our field, the big one will be probably an influenza uh, epidemic like the Spanish flu, which killed about 50 million people after World War I, more than in the, in the whole of the, you know, the war. And uh, one day this will happen and we must make sure we are ready for that.